Other times the need isn't so obvious at all. Those are the things that we stumble over and sometimes miss, like the disciples might have in the boat. The outcome of the Mother Teresa story and the woman who went there, it really didn't have so much to do with Calcutta. She came back, she spent her sabbatical doing a few other things, she experienced what you might think was some, were some typical re-entry problems as she came back to our very affluent culture. And then she started to look around and realize that there was need right in front of her. That her college students, her students with their exceptionally fine secular education, were asking all kinds of questions about the role of faith in their lives as students and in their future life as workers, about what it meant for them in their relationships at college, what it might mean for them in their relationships and the things they chose to do when they graduated from college. She started to see that right there on her own college campus was her own Calcutta, and she and a couple of her colleagues put a class together to which they invited some of the undergraduates to come and start to discuss these questions. Their need wasn't physical or material, but those young people had a definite spiritual need to answer some of their questions and to find different ways to seek the God and God's invitation that they were looking for. The same thing happens to us all the time, I think, in our homes and in our workplaces we often don't see those little opportunities that actually are very meaningful. When Jesus interrupts us, it's not just to pester us. He always invites us to respond because he is filled with hope for us and he sees things in us that we don't see in ourselves at all. Usually our first response, it's something like the ones we've heard from Isaiah and Peter. Not me. Woe is me, says Isaiah. Go away from me, says Peter. I know when I felt the call to go to seminary a few years ago, at first it seemed all like abundance. This wonderful opportunity, this great change, the letters started coming, the acceptances, the chances to do new things, all these amazing courses to sign up for, it just felt like total abundance raining down on me. And then the woe is me, not me part started. I thought this could not be what God had in mind. Not for me to leave my family every single week for three years and go to Pittsburgh, where by the way there is so much snow this week that nobody wants to go there. Not, not for me to give up a good job. The day after I announced that I was leaving my job, they put an ad in the Plain Dealer and they got 70 resumes the next day. I thought, what am I doing? Abandoning a job that 70 other people want. I, I just thought this, this couldn't be it. And the worst thing of all was, you know, I'm not 25 anymore. And many of my friends are starting to think about retirement. And here I was thinking about something completely new. And they were saying things like, well, if I can stay in this job for seven or eight more years, I'll be all set. And I was thinking, in seven or eight more years, I'll just be getting started. It definitely sounded like, woe is me. I think that's also true of any of us. It's true throughout the Bible. Remember that rich young man who comes to Jesus and he follows all the rules. He does everything he's supposed to do and says, what should I do now? And Jesus tells him to sell everything he has and give the proceeds away. And he walks away completely dejected. He can't believe that this might be what he has to do. The disciples in general, we see it over and over again. They, they try to do what Jesus wants. They try to respond to him. But there are always ways in which they stumble. Part of the richness of Jesus' abundance, though, is that he sees us in these unexpected and creative ways, and it doesn't bother him to interrupt us at all. He sees things in us that we can't see in ourselves. He imagines us serving others on behalf of him in ways we can't imagine. For me, after all of that, not me, 
Seminary's almost finished after three years. Nothing has really gone as expected so far, but it seems that it was the right journey to take. We don't actually even know about that rich young man. The story's open-ended. He goes away, but we don't know if he ever comes back. We do know that Isaiah became probably the greatest prophet of Old Testament times, and we know that the disciples, in general, and in this story, we hear they left everything and followed him. That actually doesn't sound so good. It sounds worse than going fishing after a whole night's work. Do we really have to leave everything? I think what we most have to leave is our complacency are doing everything just the way we've always done it, with the people we've always done it, at the same time and same place in which we've always done it. We have to leave that behind to follow Jesus, and we have to leave behind our inattentiveness. Do we even know when he's interrupting us? Do we know when abundance is plopped right down in front of us? When our God of hope invites us to fish in deeper waters. Abundance as a gift and as an invitation, do we recognize it? It might look really ordinary. We don't expect Jesus to appear in those mundane moments when we are exhausted by what seems to be the complete futility of our efforts. We're often blind to the abundance that lies before us when we're worn down by life's cares and challenges. It's also likely to be something we resist. We have our to-do lists. We know who we have to call and where we have to go to get to the end of the day and maybe check off most of those things. And we really don't want to be interrupted by someone else. To be honest, when all is said and done, we often find it difficult to imagine that Jesus is calling us to anything. And yet there he is, standing on the shore, or in the office, or in the kitchen, or in the classroom, or anywhere else that we do not expect him to be. And what he longs for is to give to us extravagantly, so that we may go and do likewise. Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Welcome the interruptions. Pay attention to the one who is paying attention to you. Let him fill you with a sense of wonder and hope in place of your disappointments and put out into the deep water and let your nets down. Thanks be to God.